Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to repeat a little of what Tom said um, if, you've, if you came into the room slightly after that introduction. Um, so today's session, Changing Ways of Working with Young People and Contemporary Art. Um, I'll be guiding you through the next two hours. If you have any questions, thoughts or concerns at any point, we're going to make the most use of the chat function that we possibly can and myself and Tom uh, will do our best to keep up with that. Um, you can also contact either of us directly using the chat function if you prefer. Um, as a starter and just to make sure that everyone's chat is working, could you type in a quick hello followed by your name and job title or work area? Just to everyone in the chat, thank you. We'll go ping, 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 ping in a minute. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. There will be a chance um, in breakout sessions after the presentations uh, to have group discussions, to introduce uh, yourselves to each other um, uh, in person or, or virtually rather than on the chat. So, um, but it's lovely to see such a wide range of professionals here um, and some, some that I know and some that I don't. So that's also wonderful. Um, we've got quite a full agenda um, and so I'm going to just keep rolling whilst you continue to uh, add to the chat. Um, the event has been designed in response to two key questions. How have visual arts organisations adapted to engaging young people remotely? Which ways of working will we keep and what will we leave behind? So your honesty and your generosity in sharing your experiences is greatly appreciated throughout. We're here as a supportive group, as fellow colleagues. Um, so I hope that we can uh, engage uh, fully with the process today. It's also been designed in response to your feedback through the survey, which asked you what you wanted to gain from the session. And overwhelmingly, the response was more ideas, please, more ideas for how to develop young people's programme um, and engaging young people in projects. So hopefully you'll come away with lots of ideas uh, and full of tips to take forward in your work. Um, as I said, my name is Marina. Um, you can contact me following the session if you feel that there's an aspect that you'd like to explore in more detail, and I'll do my best to find some time to take that forward with you. Um, I have about 25 years experience working in creative arts learning. I started off as a freelance digital artist running workshops for young people in recovery from substance misuse at a local gallery. Their collection became a starting point for all sorts of creative workshops. We explored everything from identity to mental health. It was a formative start to my career, which has since involved working as a national manager for Tate, leading their young people's programme, to more recently designing programme for all audiences as head of learning at Tanner Art Gallery in Eastbourne, where I live. Whatever I do with the background in Eastbourne here, the sun is shining. It's meant to be the sunniest place in the whole of Great Britain. Uh, so forgive that sunshine rolling through. I now work in a freelance capacity, having just completed an MA in creative writing, and soon I'll be studying a PhD researching silenced voices and marginalised women in Cyprus. During the height of the pandemic in this country, I delivered workshops and designed resources for young people in partnership with Ditchling Museum, with a particular focus on connecting with nature in response to an artist called John Newling. One of my big takeaways from that time was the need to approach well-being in new ways, 
not only for the young people we were working with, but also for those working with them, the adults in the room. So before I introduce and we hear from three fabulous speakers, I'm going to suggest we all take a couple of minutes where we keep our videos off, we close our eyes perhaps, and we reflect on our own practice, not just during lockdown, but also pre-pandemic. There was a time pre-pandemic. And I think it's really important that we connect back to that practice, as well as think about, think about recent changes to practice during the pandemic. This is an individual exercise, it's for you. Um, it's for you to catch up on the chat if you haven't done so. I'm not going to ask you to share any of those reflections, but we will come back to them at a later stage. So whatever your clock is saying, two minutes from now, just take some time out to ground yourself. I'll remain with my camera on in case of any issues. Otherwise, I'll see your faces again in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Um, I hope that's given you a chance to feel fully present now within the event. Uh, feel a bit grounded and be able to focus on the key questions for this afternoon. Um, but you're not really here to hear from me, you're here to hear from three wonderful speakers. Um, and the first up is Hannah K Kemp Welsh. Hannah is a socially engaged sound artist. She works with community groups to, cord to create audio installations, radio broadcasts and online artworks. She's particularly skilled and experienced at working with young people. And I first met her what feels like many years ago when we were working together at Tate. Now she runs projects all around the country with organizations such as the National Gallery, Kettle's Yard, First Sight, the John Hansard Gallery, and many others. Currently her five channel audio installation called Hear My Story, Made With Young People, is on display at Tate Britain. But today, Hannah is going to share details of three main projects completed during lockdown and touch on a few other examples too. Her work is fascinating, rich and complex, like all our speakers' work is. So feel free to put questions as you think of them into the chat and we'll pick up on them afterwards. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Marina, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you all. Let's see, share sound, share screen, and present. Um, great, I'm so happy to be here with you all. Thank you very much for the invitation, Marina. Um, uh, you, in your intro, Marina said ideas, people want ideas. Well, I have absolutely hundreds of them, which I would love to share with you now. I have 10 minutes. Uh, and a lot to say. So I'm gonna whiz through some various strategies that I've employed for working with young people during the times of the restrictions of the pandemic. And we're gonna have a bit of time afterwards for questions. So uh, if I haven't spoken in very much detail, but you are interested to hear more then please do put a question in the chat um, and uh, we'll try and get to that. Uh, so as Marina introduced me, I'm a, a sound artist with a socially engaged practice and I do a lot of work with community groups. And the thing that really interests me is how to make community concerns audible in the public realm. I've been working increasingly with radio broadcast as a strategy to uh, make people's voices heard in uh, new ways uh, in society. And I'm really developing my practice at the moment in the direction of transmission arts, thinking about the radio spectrum as an artistic material and different ways of engaging with new audiences via that space. Um, as Marina said as well, I, we started out working with Marina at Tate and since then I've had lots of uh, roles uh, more formally in, in museums and galleries and education departments. And at the time of the pandemic, I happened to be uh, the youth programmer at the National Gallery uh, for a few months as a, a maternity cover role, having been a freelancer at the National Gallery for a couple of years. And we were working with a group of, mm, I think there we had 12 young people 
and uh, the pandemic happened. And so, you know, we were kind of in this space where we consulted with the young people as to how they would like to proceed in terms of engagement with us. It so happens that that group uh, did all have access to mobile phones and digital devices. So we continue to meet weekly uh, via those. In fact, we increased the frequency of our meetings because they were concerned about feeling isolated. Uh, with lots of their other life activities had been cancelled. So we met weekly via Zoom, Teams, one of those kind of platforms. And we really tried to see what new opportunities we had by being in this digital space. One of them happens to be that uh, we were able to meet with members of staff at the gallery who may not have ordinarily had time to run a workshop or introduce uh, what they do to the group of young producers. So for example, they, were, they had the opportunity to interview the director and um, uh, learn from the conservation team, have kind of digital uh, meetings and Q&As with various different departments, which generated quite a lot of uh, joy as well as learning. But what we were very aware of was the fact that we were a very privileged group in the way that we were able to meet in this online space by digital devices, and that not all young people have that kind of access. And the group of young people that we were working with at the National Gallery called the Young Producers were very socially minded young people and so they really felt very strongly that they would like to extend the offer to uh, young people who weren't able to engage with the gallery via digital devices. And so they decided to create a activity pack uh, which would be disseminated to uh, young people who didn't have access to computers, laptops, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we did a kind of scope where we, uh, a kind of scoping survey where we contacted our networks within the youth sector and said, look, you know, what, what are the possibilities for engagement with young people at your centre, for example, Centrepoint, which is an organisation working with homeless young people. Do you have like one screen with a projector at the centre where if we were to do a, a, a workshop, people could come and watch? But they decided that the best thing that, that, that we could do would be to create a sort of, sort of resource that they would be able to print themselves at the centre and then distribute to young people. So we used the artworks in the collection as stimulus to think about different ways that we could engage with them. So the young people themselves came out with activities, uh, you know, and kind of gave advice and tips. They drew these beautiful pictures to illustrate how you might be able to, um, uh, to do various kind of questioning, thoughtful, creative activities from home. They really were kind of keen on this idea of escape and, uh, you know, kind of, I think, during a time where we were all uh, secluded in our homes, this is something we could all relate to. And uh, they were looking at the paintings and seeing potentials for escape within the paintings. One of the things that we were able to do via Zoom workshops is some quite intensive skills development. So we did workshops with sound design, with animation. And young people decided also that they wanted to be more visible uh, as part of the gallery. Uh, the National Gallery being a, a, a big organisation, uh, you know, having a kind of profile for young people and their work and their contribution to, her, to, to the gallery was, was really important to them. And so, you know, we worked in, uh, we, we had conversations with the digital and the marketing teams and they uh, were keen on the young people's idea of uh, having short Instagram videos, uh, which they constructed. And I'm just going to play you one. But before I do, excuse the geekery here, but as a sound artist, I uh, worked really closely with young people to show them different techniques for recording sounds. And they created all of the sound effects for these videos, as well as animating them and captioning them and writing the script and recording the script. They recorded the scripts from in underneath bed clothes to have good sound quality or from the inside of their cupboards behind coats to have that nice muffled sound without the horrible boomy echo. They also recorded very closely with their phones different creaking sounds the floorboards and one of the sounds that you're going to hear here is the best creak that I have ever heard recorded and which I have since with the, the young person the artist's permission used again and again in some of my radio work so please do listen out for that creak which I just think is magical let me play it now can you hear it no, hang on. Why are you not hearing anything? Aha, apologies. I had, had it muted. I like to spend time with my friends. This painting likely depicts a scene on the famous French river, the Seine. 
What captures my eye are the two women, set in the centre of the painting, sharing a boat. They're dressed in delicate colours, reading and rowing. It's a dreamy scene. They could be two friends, slowly flowing away from the distant villa, choosing to spend the summer's day together. Renoir depicts their reflections surrounded by the warm glow of the boat, perhaps reflecting the warmth of their friendship. I imagine they'll be there for hours, gossiping, sharing stories, or just being content in each other's company. If a boat ride with a loved one isn't possible, we can always maintain contact through a simple message, phone call, or even a letter. How about reaching out today? Thank you for sharing that moment with me. So that was one of a series of one minute videos and it received 40,000 views uh, on Instagram and, you know, had a, a plethora of comments from, you know, regular gallery visitors saying how much they enjoyed hearing young people's reflections on the paintings. And actually, you know, we hope then, um, you know, generated more profile for young people's programs there as well as made the young people really feel valued and a sense of achievement, uh, which they should do because it was a fantastic series. Uh, another uh, kind of strategy that, that we used for organizing online uh, events, I'll move into different kinds of uh, engagements a bit later on, was uh, working for the London Metropolitan Archives. They've been uh, digitising some sound artefacts such as vinyl cassettes, CDs, as part of a national project called Unlocking Our Sound Heritage. So as an archive space, they predominantly have, you know, documents uh, and uh, photographs, books, etc. Not typically a space young people hang out. Uh, and so we really saw this opportunity of the audio archives as being uh, a way to, to share some of the, the amazing voices of Londoners, uh, which the, the archive stores. There was this particularly amazing collection, uh, which is captures voices and poetry uh, of black political activists, Jessica and Eric Huntley, who did lots of amazing work, including organizing the first uh, Black People's Day of Action, uh, the New Crossfire um, Massacre Committee, and uh, they had their own publishing house. And they did a lot of amazing activist work in the community. And they also the, were sort of early publishers of Lem Sisse and people who are very prominent poets today. So we had this audio archive, which we really wanted to share. Uh, and we particularly had a target focus of uh, engaging with 18 to 34 year olds. And so we decided that the best thing to do would be to uh, put an open call out for young curators to curate events using these audio archives as stimulus to uh, lead events for their peers. And I'm not going to play you any audio for this, but I'll just kind of, you know, have a little bit of this on in the background. We had this curator called uh, Alia Hasina, who curated a really fantastic event, uh, bouncing off the audio archive as stimulus to cu uh, curate an event about the exclusion of black students, both in the 1980s, where the archive material was from, and today. And she invited an academic, Kahinsky Andrews, uh, who's a prominent writer about black studies, as well as her own primary school teacher uh, and a secondary school teacher to discuss um, uh, how uh, young people are treated in the education system today. This uh, was a really popular event. We had uh, 800 views on YouTube Live. It's now being uh, put, uh, transformed into a podcast, hopefully broadcast on No Signal, which is a black uh, owned radio station, which has emerged out of the pandemic. So I thought that was uh, another useful example, perhaps, to share about ways of engaging with young people online. Uh, the, the, the next projects I'll talk about, I'll just skim over very briefly, uh, but I think that there's been lots of uh, interesting strategies used there. It's the uh, anniversary of Houseman's Bookshop. They've been around for 60 years. Some of you will know Houseman's in London as a site of activism, both the campaigning against nuclear disarmament and also as an early uh, helpline called Switchboard for uh, um, uh, the LGBT community during times where being gay was criminalised. Uh, and so, you know, this, this particular venue has this rich history and young people uh, conducted landline telephone calls, which they recorded with people who remember the activism at the bookshop in earlier days. And they then transformed these into radio plays, which we again did lots of sound design for. And the series of radio plays has now uh, is currently being built into an interactive website. 
something completely different. And as you can see from the picture, not with young people, but I think that this perhaps is a useful idea for working with people who don't perhaps have access to technology. Working with the Albany and Intelliki Arts in South London, they have a, a, a Tuesday arts program for elders in the community. And these elders, of course, during the pandemic were the people who uh, often were most neglected and uh, really were isolated for an incredible amount of time and uh, have perhaps the least access to technology as well. And so we thought about how we can reach people in their homes uh, whilst they must remain in isolation. And we thought about FM radio as a way of doing this. So we posted FM radio set to a local community radio station channel to uh, the elders. And then we conducted landline group telephone calls with them via Skype, which we recorded. And then we edited their memories and conversations together with sounds from all around the globe. So, you know, memories of going to Margate as a child or memories of growing up in Guyana. And we found field recordings from all over the globe to illustrate their stories and packaged these as a weekly radio show, which then enabled them to hear each other's voices from home via FM radio. And another project is I'm currently working on, I'm the artist in residence at the Women's Art Library. And the Women's Art Library has an amazing collection of uh, including the Women of Colour uh, Index Network and uh, many other uh, um, kind of amazing artifacts documenting women's art uh, um, from the 80s. And again, the, the archive is closed. And so uh, I created these kinds of packs and these packs had lots of different material and ephemera uh, relating to some of the artists represented in the collection. And then I posted the packs to uh, people in the community and then either met them on a park bench or invited them to answer a series of questions via, and we did voice note exchange via exchanges via WhatsApp. So that we then kind of created a sort of mail art, but via WhatsApp and via post chain, where we were able to explore some of the artists together through physical kind of contact with these materials, but also through exchange of voices. And finally, uh, a project that was really dear to my heart, which I worked on for, for a, a long time over lockdown was uh, I discovered uh, by accident buying a cassette player in Argos that the main buyers of cassette players in Argos are people who are buying them for their benefits assessments for personal independence payment, which is um, for people who have long-term health conditions. And it so turns out that the government have ruled that you are not allowed to have an audio record of your benefits assessment, which is conducted by a pri private company, other than on a cassette, two cassette players, which you must source yourself, which of course are very expensive, uh, completely redundant medium, break all the time, have terrible sound quality, et cetera. So I convened in Bach and Dagenham with the help of Studio 3 Arts, the group of people with experience of applying for personal dependence payments who are disabled, and I posted them all a cassette player and blank cassettes. And we did an exchange of our outrage at this system via cassettes, and then cut, snipped up the tape and pasted it together into an audio activist piece demonstrating the terrible quality of tape recording uh, and therefore the government's incompetence at ruling that this must be used as a formal legal record of events. And we wrote lots of letters to the government and we had a big exchange with them about this ridiculous system. And actually we managed to get a firm commitment from the government as a result of this art project that they would change the system as of the easing of lockdown. And they have promised us that audio recording devices will now be available on site at every benefits assessment center as a result of the campaigning that this group did in this you know absurd lockdown art project of cassette exchanges uh, so these are just some just some ideas for some different ways that i worked during during lockdown when we weren't able to meet uh, and if you have any questions about them then i would love to hear them and i'd love to you know expand elaborate or uh, answer for any questions that you might have thank you Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, as, as I warned you, it, it's a rich and complex practice, but full of lots of ideas. Um, uh, one of the things that I picked up on that I'd like everyone to hold as a thought throughout the rest of the event, if that's okay, um, is your, as, as a socially engaged artist, 
kind of key to that is collaboration or co-creation. And often when we're thinking about how to generate ideas in our work with young people or how to engage young people, if we consider it from the perspective of collaboration, then our role changes slightly. Our role becomes one of much more, I think, of facilitating those ideas from young people rather than going to them with perhaps pre-made ideas. So I just want us all to kind of keep the idea of uh, supporting young people, uh, release their own ideas rather than the responsibility always being on us as practitioners. Um, I am conscious of time. Um, I have built in a bit of flex. I don't want the speakers to feel so rushed uh, that they don't breathe. Um, so uh, don't worry, uh, we'll make up the time. Um, and over to you, has anyone got any questions? Maybe whilst people type, I'll just say that, um, you know, one of the kind of early inspirations for this sort of exchange of things was actually, I think, Marina, you mentioned at the beginning that you're kind of the first thing in um, your kind of your career was a project with young people. And I remember you telling me a story where you gave um, cameras, disposable cameras to young people and invited them to go and document their lives. And this became the source material for a project. That's an idea that's really stuck with me of this generosity of giving something and then allowing people to use that tool as a, a tool for exploration. So I think that would actually form a wonderful lockdown project today as well, if those kinds of cameras are still available. <laughs> now you make me feel old. Uh, but yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, reminding me of that example. Uh, I think our I think generosity with young people, particularly vulnerable young people, is really important. So, yeah. And also that that mix of what you were talking about, how you use um, actual stuff, physical materials or, or mediums um, within a digital project. So those two working alongside um, and being conscious of, of digital inclusion. Uh, we had a great comment uh, from Jess White, thank you, saying win when it came to the project uh, with the government. Okay, quick question from Lindsay, thank you. Um, Hannah, has the experience fundamentally your changed your practice for the future? Uh, mm, I think Yes, yes. I think um, providing sort of hybrid ways of engaging with people, especially, um, uh, you know, working with a group of people who were wheelchair users uh, and the barriers to access that they usually face and actually having to go to arts centres, um, you know, certainly made me think that I would like to continue to do online projects and telephone projects and WhatsApp exchange projects. Uh, and I was also working with a group of young mothers and they also said that they would love to engage with projects, but they just don't have the time and flexibility to be able to do so. And so working through uh, WhatsApp exchanges and other other ways, I think, rather than I think we we. We used to talk about um, in a youth programme that I worked in, kind of not always saying, come to my house, come to my house, the house being the gallery, you know, and that instead we can, uh, you know, go to the spaces where young people already are. And, um, and at the moment, that is obviously online uh, for those young people with that kind of access. Thank you, Hannah. Wonderful. Uh, if any thoughts um, either on Hannah's presentation or the next occur, um, feel free to keep using the chat and I'll pick up on those. Next up, our second speaker is Anna. Anna is uh, an engagement officer at the Thelma Hulbert Gallery and she's been there since 2014. She's particularly respected for developing strong partnerships with cultural and education sectors to design programmes which activate contemporary exhibitions for vulnerable groups. And in recognition of her work, uh, she's recently been awarded the prestigious March Award for Excellence in Gallery Education by uh, the membership organisation Engage, who, if you haven't heard of them, I highly recommend you check them out. Um, I'll add a link in the chat. Um, but before I do that, please welcome Anna, over to you. 
Hi everyone, I'll just uh, do that thing of sharing my screen. There's a bit of sound. So, um, let's see if this works properly. I'm slightly nervous it's not going to. Um, so the project I've come to tell you about is um, came out of the COVID thing last year. It's totally changed my role at the gallery and, um, and the reach of the art gallery particularly. Um, and it had a really great effect on the local community and it's called The Creative Cabin. That little animation was on some of the shorts, uh, which um, I'll talk about a bit later. But first off, I'm going to give you a bit of background into the gallery and how the project was able to come about. So um, the Thelma Hulbert Gallery is based in Honiton. It's in that Georgian building you can see there. And it was the former home of the artist Thelma Hulbert who retired there. She was a painter of the Euston Road School of Art and had some renown in the, the 60s and 70s an example of one of her paintings. We've got some of her work in the gallery and exhibit that alongside a programme of contemporary art and craft exhibitions of local, regional and national significance um, and have a coordinated learning programme that goes alongside that. Um, yeah, and my, yeah, it's quite funny how my, much my job has changed over recent years, um, but never more so than in this last year, which I'm sure many of us are, have had some experiences. So, um, the gallery is owned by uh, East Devon District Council, who cover much of our core costs, but the exhibitions and lots of the associated activity is funded externally, largely through Arts Council England, but also through other funds such as National Lottery Heritage Fund or, um, and local charities and other initiatives. Um, but we really found in recent years the benefit of linking up with um, other organisations to fund uh, joint projects which has helped support both our exhibition programme and our engagement programme. In particular, um, it, we've discovered an affinity in working alongside the East Devon and Blackdown Hills AOMBs, the areas of outstanding natural beauty, which Honiton sits right in the heart of, um, both of those two different AOMBs and um, they were really supportive on this uh, Creative Cabin initiative as of course were Tate and Artist Rooms. Uh, so the, our general connection with the communities largely through, well, goes across all age ranges from memory cafes to children's centres, primary schools through to university students, um, put a lot of emphasis on trying to make sure that our provision is inclusive and accessible. And we frequently work with the special schools um, and the pupil referral units uh, and with organisations such as Devon Insight and Devon Recovery Learning Community. Um, which I'll explain a bit more about in a sec. So partly because of the way the um, East Devon District Council is structured, uh, Thelma Holbert Gallery is closely aligned with Wild East Devon, who have proved to be an inv invaluable partners over this time. Um, we both have a remit of benefiting health and wellbeing, including promoting positive action towards combating climate change following East Devon District Council's declaration of the climate emergency. It seems like such a long time ago that we first started talking about um, that having talking with Tate and Artist Rooms about the prospect of hosting an exhibition, like a whole world away really now. Um, but having previously hosted touring shows from Hayward Gallery, Crafts Council and then the Arts Council collection, it was really great to be considered for Tate Artist Room, for a Tate Artist Room show. Um, with all the status that comes with Tate and Artist Dreams, we were thrilled when we heard that we were hosting Richard Long and we had a decent lead in time for this exhibition and on top we were awarded a learning bursary which really opened up the options of what we would be able to deliver for the local and wider communities. Very exciting times of planning. The learning bursary holds a focus of reaching 13 to 25 year olds and creating a lasting legacy for them and we had plans in place particularly to work with the teenagers on the East Devon District Council estates we were aiming to create a podcast or a short film um, through connecting them to their local rural areas. Having attended a seminar at um, Tully House, I'm never sure if I'm saying that right, in Carlisle, 
which was also supported by Tate Artist Rooms, um, I was really inspired by the ideas, not only for the content and structure of our engagement programme, but also in the range and importance of evaluation as a tool to help you discover what you need to know about your audience in order to augment it, um, which I think really chimes, well, that, that whole thing that we we're just saying about um, letting the young people speak, you know, giving them the, the, the root of the activity is so important. But anyway, of course, like everywhere else, uh, we had to unpick these plans um, just as they were about to happen. And um, it was really daunting because there's no clarity about whether we'd be, you'd be able to pick them back up again. But thanks to the vision of Ruth, the manager curator at Thelma, and the flexibility and support of Tate and Artist Rooms, uh, we were able to rechannel some of our bursary um, to rework an old council display trainer and uh, turn it into the creative cabin. And that opportunity came about because of working closely with Wild East Devon. It was a, a trailer that they used to use. And uh, we were able to uh, bring in the talents of designers to not only create a um, fun, inspirational space, but also themed worksheets um, geared to appear to um, all ages. So this new format allowed us to share many of the engagements we had planned in a new way, working outside, allowing space for social distancing, minimal use of tools, ensuring that artists, workshop leaders and participants could interact safely and still have access to creativity. Um, bringing the gallery and the activity out to the public and community was a whole new way of working and being able to show Richard Long at work through the videos on the TV screen, uh, which you can see just in the, I'm going to point at my screen now, <laughs> but there's a little TV screen inside the cabin and having books and cards with examples of his work, we activated all of this by offering those that participated the chance to immerse themselves in an aspect of Richard Long's process, specifically um, using clay and your hands to paint. Um, I'm a bit behind with my slide. So uh, it was something of a surprise to me just quite how good an artist he would be to work with during this time. But the apparent simplicity of his artwork and it being so rooted in the land meant that anyone could relate to it. The physicality of painting with clay is not only fun, it holds a mindfulness to it. And uh, we use this process with so many groups from the public at Exmouth Seafront to the Taunton Youth Approval Feral Unit, all with positive results. Um, I just wanted to show you a little example of one of his films that was playing on that screen that we showed to the I'm obviously part of that very long tradition, starting with, from cave painters <laughs> who've depicted or used the landscape as their subject. I don't like labels anyway, really. But I'm happy with the term landscape artist, I think. Well, I am a landscape artist. So it just gives you a little flavour of the kind of things people were looking at to support the activities. Um, and another sort of response that um, we used with the um, Devon Recovery Learning Community who offer courses for adults recovering or managing mental health issues, um, where we looked at Richard Long's artwork in the gallery in relation to our senses. So we ran a, a, a five week course with them looking at all our different senses and particularly enjoyed um, one where we made a soundtrack to some of the pieces, just using a piece of paper. They only had a piece of paper to create the work. So there's a little example. just something really simple um, it could be really effective and they really enjoyed that um, process. So we had originally intended for the Creative Cabin to host a range of artists, uh, particularly photographers and printmakers. Um, 
as part of the original engagement program but due to the potential risk and the restrictions and then the rule of six we moved their content to online running a sequence of nature shorts and then creative cabin shorts in the second lockdown um, and for many of these artist practitioners this is the first time they had made a short film and the opportunity was a much needed and meaningful offer which also kick-started a new avenue for them one clearly appreciated by our audience with great engagement rates it's funny because while numbers are so much lower than uh, so many others, but I think we are a, quite a small gallery. So we were very pleased with having 30,000 or close to that um, views. Um, but part of that was because we teamed up with the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital Trust and the North Devon Healthcare Trust, who um, sent all of these shorts directly into the inboxes of their NHS workers as a, a, to boost morale and um, help with their wellbeing. And became part of the brief for the artists to um, create their content with that in mind. So it became practical to keep the delivery of activity to the team within THG and Wild East Devon and we devised a suite of activities that could be offered to schools and the public which connected to Richard Long and ensured a low risk to both participants and the workshop leaders but our main key advantage of course was working outside. The only drawback being that we had to start work at the end of the summer so it wasn't too long before it got too cold for us to work with some groups although we did manage to do like this workshop that you can see here where we were screen printing with clay um was in december but however in that time frame with roughly four months we reached close to 2,000 people through these events and people love working with the creative cabin it draws folks to it and we have witnessed on multiple occasions some genuine delight with the activities partly due to their simplicity but also due to the positivity of reconnecting with others and with nature and art. Bringing what normally happens away from other people's gaze, you know, it might be closed in a closed space like the learning room at the gallery or in a classroom or another location. Putting that into a visible space, um, you could see the benefit not only for those taking part, but those witnessing it. Um, there's something heartening about watching others immerse themselves in creative activity. So we're now moving into a new phase of working with the Creative Cabin where the emphasis on climate will become even more central to our themes. We're working with an artist photographer, Mike Perry, just launched an exhibition um, in the last couple of weeks. And, we'll, um, and the, alongside it, there's an initiative which will be partly hosted within and supported by the Creative Cabin. Uh, the Creative Cabin Climate Conversations on Tour is a new strand of activity um, where we'll use the exhibitions, workshops, volunteering opportunities and resources and working with our partners at the East Devon and Blackdown Hills um, AOMBs and the University of Exeter will assist communities to understand the comp complex issues and make real sustainable changes by bringing communities together on a shared challenge. Um, we've developed, I wanted to show you these sheets which are um yeah to try and make people feel positive about uh making a change or the changes that they might be able to make and help others to make in their communities but due to the timing of opening up coinciding with the warmer weather we can now confidently reach most of the or more of the groups um that we made plans to reach last year. So the memory cafes, schools, the East Devon District Council Estates and many other groups within our communities who are in need of a chance to creative interactions. We're finding out more through our Climate Conversations programme. We're going to be hosting events, I think, yes. So the blue spots are what we did last year and the orange spots are what we're going to be doing this year. So it goes right across the region um, from the little village school to big touristy events like the Sidmouth Sea Fest. Um, but the springboard that our initial outing with the Creative Cabin has given to this new iteration is brilliant and um, yeah, we're really excited about it. I think that's uh, all I can say and I'm quite happy to take any questions and tell you any more you might possibly want to know. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, a really, really inspiring uh, example of a project there. Just the name Creative Cabin is inspiring for me. Um, and, and lovely to be reminded that simple ideas can be really powerful. It doesn't have to be a complicated idea. Um, I'm quite conscious of time and I can't see any questions 
in the chat as yet. If anyone wants to directly unmute themselves and ask, feel free. those awkward silences with questions it's all it's always the way um not reflection on the presentation at all uh, a difficult format thank you so much um so last but by no means least is lindsay smith our third presenter a photographer and artist facilitator she has a broad and deep practice of working with a wide range of audiences especially young people to produce films, workshops and resources with over 25 years experience. During the pandemic and the focus of her presentation today, she was commissioned by PhotoWorks, a Brighton-based international development agency, as well as the University of Brighton and the Greater Brighton Metropolitan College. I think I've got that right. Um, she will share her insights through a rapid image-based presentation looking at the successes and challenges of each project and again there'll be time for questions at the end so thank you ever so much Lindsay over to you thank you Maureen okay let me see if I can get this it's always that moment of sharing the screen okay okay can everybody see that okay good thank you Hello, okay, so Marina's probably covered my first slide, which is good. We're tight on time, so I can skip a minute. <laughs> but yeah, I introduced myself as a photographic artist and freelance artist facilitator. And what I wanted to do was uh, go through, sort of make mention of about five different initiatives that I've um, led, I suppose, over the last 16 months. Um, and just kind of identify some of the successes of those, some of the challenges and some of the kind of persistent sort of cons ongoing considerations that each of those has flagged up for me personally and the organisations that I've been working in partnership with. Okay, so this photograph is pre-COVID, <laughs> can you guess? Um, so this is actually from a module which I'll go on to describe in a moment called Photography and Community that I lead each year with the University of Brighton. And this is actually a picture from 2018 uh, mentor undergraduates in, in going into um, sixth form colleges and schools to work with young people um, to deliver uh, interactive photography workshops. So yeah, very much about getting people together to look at, talk about and make photographic artwork. So there's obviously been a big overhaul in the last 16 months about how, how I can continue to do that. Okay, so in um, March 2020, um, I had started to deliver a PhotoWorks photography club. So as Marina said, PhotoWorks, um, they, they describe themselves as an international platform that champions photography for everyone, providing opportunities for artists and audiences. And the photography club um, is devised by Juliet Buss, uh, who's the learning and engagement consultant for PhotoWorks. And it's a programme for 13 to 18 year olds. And it's usually uh, delivered in partnership uh, with different community organisations. So the two that I'm going to talk about today have both been um, commissioned in partnership with widening participation stroke outreach team at the University of Brighton. But other photography clubs um, have been led in partnership with um, a range of organisations, for example, All Sorts Youth Project, which is a Brighton based youth project that supports um, and connects children and young people under the age of 16 who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or are exploring their sexual orientation. So I'm just mentioning that because there is another photography club running at the moment in partnership with all sorts. So the photography club that I was running um, started in February 2020 and was interrupted by the national lockdown. So we'd had one session in the university, an all day workshop, and I think the programme was running every two weeks. So two weeks later, armed with hand gel, we all piled onto trains and went up to London, which in hindsight now is like what we do. But um, we went up to London on the 7th of March and made it to the exhibition, um, the Gerwood um, Photo Works Prize um, at the Gerwood Art Space in London, which uh, this is a photograph of the group in the gallery space. So after the 7th of March, two weeks later, obviously we're in a very, very different place. Uh, lockdown is imminent. So it's, it was essentially cancelled, the project was cancelled. Um, 
I think we were in shock, to be honest, for a couple of weeks and not much happened. I suddenly had a three-year-old running around my feet 24-7, had a partner working in the bedroom. Um, so I wasn't really able to do very much at all. But two weeks later, Julia and I got over the initial shock and started to have conversations about how could we continue to run this as a remote project. So what we ended up opting for was a bi-weekly digital project packs being um, created and disseminated via a shared Google Drive. So we contacted all the young people that had, had sort of um, signed up for the programme originally to see who would still be up for taking part as a remote project. Um, 15 had originally enrolled and 11 said yes, I'm up for it, so that's great. So it's mainly my circumstances, if I'm really honest, that um, led it to being a sort of remote uh, project packed based delivery. But we also had some concerns with the huge shift for young people to online learning for schools and colleges. We just weren't sure that adding another layer to that at that time was particularly appropriate. So we started devising these project packs. This slide uh, is an example of one of the pages in the packs. And the packs included practical instructions, inspirational quotes, uh, prompts to get them thinking, artists to research and links to relevant online exhibitions. So quite big, but the idea was that people could pick and choose what they wanted to dip into. Okay, we also, something that we did was we started to post out materials for the different project briefs. So there were five project briefs in total based on my original intentions for the workshops and very much inspired by the um, PhotoWorks Gerard Prize exhibition. Um, but the materials, posting out materials, was something that was really key and something that I continued to carry into to, to projects later on. The, uh, the materials uh, were set up on the Google Drive, young people sent in their responses and we set up a blog. It was intended to kind of be conversational, so PhotoWork staff, um, university ambassadors, project staff all commented on the young people's photos and some young people commented back. But that conversation wasn't as fluid as we'd originally hoped it would be. And eventually the work was uh, translated into an online showcase on the PhotoWorks website. I can put these links up if people are interested. Okay. So this is a photo by one of the participants, Lauren, in response to one of the project briefs. So as I said, 15 originally enrolled, 11 signed up to continue online, but only three completed all five projects. We lost a lot of them around project five. Project five moved into um, moving image, which perhaps in hindsight was a little bit ambitious, but we were also chipping into July, um, end of school term. I think everyone put their books down. Um, but two young people did go on with my support to complete a bronze arts award, which was originally uh, written in to the programme, but was kind of delivered, if I'm honest, as an add-on. We put it out to everybody and see if anyone wanted to do it. And two, three took me up on it, two made it through. Um, again, just to emphasise the, the positive impact of sending out materials, the participation was so much stronger when the materials were sent out and they had something to physically work with. Something else that was noted was the direct correspondence in so me constantly emailing and having that correspondence with young people that increased as the project went on. So just that dialogue was very much one to one. I think two things that were really, really missing here was the conversation between participants. There just really wasn't that going on. And also when it came to doing the showcase on the PhotoWorks website, this participation had dropped off. So we did that in a very isolated fashion. Excuse me. Okay. The next one I was going to talk to you about is going back to that first photograph. It's the module that I deliver for University of Brighton. It's called Photography in the Community. It's a level five semester long module for students that were across, from across what was the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. Lots of restructuring going on at University of Brighton. It's essentially mentoring undergraduates in designing and delivering workshops. And it sort of functions as a professional development module with them gaining an insight into the understanding of the broader context of public engagement in the arts. Um, and this photo again, pre-COVID, is from 2019 when a group of undergraduates are preparing for workshops in the Phoenix Art Space Gallery in Brighton. And this was actually in response to the In Focus exhibition, um, which was part of the uh, Project Artworks Commissioned Explorers project. 
So I went on a deep learning curve into the world of Microsoft Teams. I have to stop myself swearing whenever anyone, whenever a commissioner says that's what I'm going to have to use to deliver things. I was very relieved to learn today was on Zoom. Um, but along with the whole of the university teaching, we went into Teams online for academic year 2021. It involved 12 three hour sessions, lots of one to one tutorials, much more than I originally scheduled. And I think something that flagged up for me was having a visitor, visiting speaker. So bringing in multiple voice, so it wasn't a singular voice during the sessions week to week. We were working with the PhotoWorks Festival box. Um, if people aren't familiar with PhotoWorks or the festival that happened in October, I again can put the link up, but do check it out. It's a really interesting response to the COVID situation, trying to reach out to a much broader audience, given that they couldn't have the usual kind of gallery based exhibitions and showcases. So the next couple of photos and slides are actually interactions with the photo um, works festival box content. So I sent it out again, taking that idea of some of the materials, sent it out to undergraduates and we played around with it, interacted with it during the sessions. We needed to devise socially, in, uh, socially distance interactions with communities. So we were working with two sixth form colleges and in consultation with them, we discussed lots of possible ways that we could kind of interact in a socially uh, distanced way. Um, and Instagram kept coming up, I think mostly due to the eruption of activity that happened on Instagram last summer. Um, and the school seemed very keen to use those channels. So three groups, there were four undergraduate groups, three of them opted to do something Instagram based and one of them opted to do a live video session via Google Meet into the classroom. Okay, successes, challenges, considerations. Uh, feedback from students and community partners was generally very positive. Something that came through was definitely this multiple voice and the involving visiting speakers and that was down so this module is delivered in partnership with PhotoWorks again, um, and they did fund additional speakers just to enrich the programme to bring in that multiple voice, multiple perspectives. So some of my own notes on facilitation successes, group activities, using breakout rooms. Breakout rooms are brilliant. Really good way to facilitate collaboration and exchange, which was very missing for me in that first project we did online using SharePoint or Google Drive to create collaborative live evolving documents that participants can use um, and interact with during the sessions. And I think it's already been said today, but sometimes chat can be such a godsend. It can be such a nice way, not only to facilitate conversation between me and the participants, but to get a conversation started amongst participants themselves, which I think is something that's often missing in line, is those kind of impromptu little whispers that happen between people so trying to use chat in that way was something that then became of real interest to me okay so then we kind of i think for me came to the fore was this the issues you can face with cameras on cameras off brings up many considerations around visibility participation privacy anonymity safeguarding technical barriers um, for many of the students on the module as soon as they turned the camera on, the team would crash. For some of them, it was totally about anxiety um, and their anxiety being induced by being present on the screen. And I sadly had one student that actually decided to intimate she couldn't, couldn't cope with the whole of her programme suddenly being online in that way. Um, live session with the students was really successful. Instagram seemed initially to fall really flat. However, one of the undergraduates rather than looking at responses, tracked the interactions and actually that flagged up that it was a lot more positive than we initially thought. So that was really interesting. Okay, I'm going to briefly mention the next project. I'm not going to go into so much detail for this. Let me check my time. But this was something that I did for Phoenix Art Gallery um, that sort of bridged the November lockdown. I won't go into detail, but the main thing I wanted to flag was their intention from the start had been to use this billboard on the outside of the building. And this was brilliant. So even though halfway through the delivery of this project, we had to stop um, in-person delivery and go online, it meant we had this kind of outdoor shared um, outcome and people brought family and friends down to see it. And that for me flagged up something that's really important and to really hold on to the public dissemination of the young people's work, 
which is true to my heart anyway with most projects, but just the importance of doing that outside to ensure that it's accessible at this time became really important to me. Okay, moving on to the Metropolitan College. I've worked with the Widen Participation Team since I think early 2019. Um, I'm sure most of you in the room are familiar with Widen Participation Agendas. Um, that's very much about raising aspirations and giving an insight into higher levels of study and graduate careers. So I've delivered targeted outreach and progression um, activities for potential and existing students at the college. So pre-COVID examples include uh, an arts award accredited holiday programme for 13 to 16 year olds. And in March 2020, I was in the college delivering a full day workshop for level two and level three photography students. Um, this image is from so the whole spring programme for 2020 was cancelled. And this is from the first online session that I delivered for them in July. So it took us a while to kind of uh, find a way to do this and agree on a way to do this. But it was a short term project that incorporated some independent study and it was around staged photography. And I just loved this project. So Daisy basically photographed a place in her local community um, took photos of her friends and then photoshopped them all together in the space and made this really lovely series of images um, of a sort of communal experience of the park space that she, she couldn't actually achieve at the time. So we uh, my experience with Jubilee Met has been so mixed, we've tried so many different things and I love that they were being really experimental with how to maintain a sort of far-reaching programme during the pandemic, but I've done one-off two to three hour practical workshops, day long contextual studies with level two photography students, short term projects like the stage photography. And we just recently completed a six session holiday programme that we did manage to do arts awards with the Bronze Arts Award. Um, so the recent holiday programme, um, I think has probably been the most successful and it included six uh, three hour sessions uh, with an invitation to expand on their practice outside of the sessions and taking lead from the Phoenix um, project, we, um, I pushed for this billboard to happen as part of the project. So this is up uh, very near to Worthing Station as an outcome of that project with an associated web page. Um, I think for me, I just wanted to say that a lot of the programmes I've delivered over the last 10 years, really, there's often an attraction to do arts award. And I think when that first photography club happened, I couldn't find a way to embed it. And it's something that I've been really experimenting with. And I feel with this one, we started to get that a little bit closer. It was embedded into the delivery. And the part D, the share of the Bronze Arts Award was brilliant in terms of facilitating a sense of community amongst the participants. They collaborated, they interacted, they led each other in activities. And for me, there was something really rich in that that I brought in into a current project. Okay, I think, according to me, I've got 30 seconds left. <laughs> So I'm now delivering another photography club. It's like a year or so later, we've come round again. So this was due to start again in February. Um, it was delayed because of the lockdown. But in line with the university WP team's um, current situation, uh, we're doing it all on teams again. Um, but there's so much that I've brought to it from, from the last um, year in the different projects. So regularly posting physical materials, involving visiting speakers, making sure there's lots of group work and opportunity for discussion amongst the young people, incorporating technical tuition. So it wasn't until the um, Easter programme for GB met that I started to teach technical photography skills again. And that was to do with me getting set up with two lots of cameras and a little mini studio set up. So it's kind of like establishing ways of working. Definitely incorporating chat as a channel um, and giving optional one-to-one -one tutorials, which I feel is just that kind of added pastoral care around the program and making sure that there's a public outcome. Um, things to consider, I think, maybe I'll move on to the next. So this is Photo Club, an example. Sorry to Club. interrupt, Lindsay. It's all right, am I going over? Of time, if you yeah, know. I'm gonna go to the last slide. I was, yeah, I'll just be, can I finish just three bullet points? <laughs> so I think for me, things that have come up that are persistent considerations for me are the benefits, the advantages and challenges that different safeguarding um, decisions play, uh, issues around visibility, anonymity of participants online, 
sending out physical materials. And perhaps I think for me, what I carry into the future is the idea of a very blended approach, um, working both digitally and in person. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. It's, that's always a horrible thing to do to interrupt, but I'm aware that we were due for a comfort break a little while ago um, and having talked about well-being and our well-being at the beginning of the session um, I'd like to keep that as a thread running through. Uh, just before we do that I just wanted to pick up on uh, your honesty around our situation, our context as practitioners and how we had to adapt during the pandemic and how that has an impact on how we work with young people. Um, that, was, that was really interesting, thank you very much for that. Okay, my clock says uh, uh, 13 minutes past. Uh, it's probably differently synced to yours. Um, but if you could come back in uh, four minutes from now, wherever your clock is at, and then we will have time for what I know everyone really looks forward to, some group discussions and networking amongst ourselves. So again, Tom and I will stay in the room, otherwise we'll see everyone back in four minutes. Thank you so much. Welcome back everyone. Thank you for those turning videos on. Uh, who had them on before? I hope that gave you a chance to perhaps at least stretch your legs um, and look at something different other than the screen for a moment. Um, I'm very conscious that group discussions and networking are key to uh, these events and having the opportunity to do that. Um, so I'm going to stick with the agenda for the moment and just shorten the timing slightly. What's going to happen now is that you're going to be uh, split up into breakout groups. You'll be assigned to your group breakout group automatically. Uh, Tom and colleagues are going to do that wizardry behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Um, if you find you're in a breakout group with colleagues that you already know or you feel uncomfortable for any reason, do send me or Tom a private message and we can move you. Um, what I'm going to suggest is you spend just a few minutes uh, introducing yourselves to each other and then um, to, cons to go back to the reflections that we started with, um, thinking about your practice. What's the one thing that you found most inspiring and the one thing that you found most challenging, either as a result of the speaker's presentations or your own practice. So one thing that's most inspiring and one thing that's most challenging. Um, it was great that uh, Lindsay mentioned safeguarding. I know for me, uh, the biggest challenge uh, during, the, during lockdown and working with young people was how we dealt with video in people's rooms, in people's homes, um, and that was, and all the kind of challenges around that. Um, my clock says 19 minutes past. <laughs> we'll give it 10 minutes if that's all right, just slightly shorter than originally planned uh, to go out into breakout rooms. Our speakers are going to join you. They're not there as facilitators, they're there as participants, uh, equal colleagues, um, but of course feel free to, to pull on their expertise if helpful. When we come back into the group as a whole in 10 minutes, I'll ask someone from each group just to share some of those key challenges and inspirations with the rest of us. Um, any questions, as always, feel free to use the chat. Thanks for putting some links up as well. Okay, Tom and colleagues, over to you, I believe. Welcome back everyone. Uh, it's so lovely to see your faces now and just not a name on a screen. Um, I'm conscious that we've lost a few people who weren't able to stay for the whole event due to other commitments. Um, but thank you for sticking with us, those that are still here. Um, may I ask one person from each group just to share uh, what, what, this, what the discussion was like in the room that you were in? Um, group do you know, group one, breakout room one. Uh, 
Okay, if that's not going to work, uh, those people that agree to speak and feedback on behalf of their group, if you just want to raise your hand, great. Thank you. Vanessa, shall we start with you if you just unmute yourself? Yeah, Thank sure. Um, so in our group, um, we mostly, we, we kind of, um, we didn't really divide up into challenges and um, positives in quite that way. We kind of jumbled everything together. So I'll report it back in that sort of way. Um, one of the things we were talking about was about the capacity online and what we already had in existence in ways of actually engaging people. And there was quite varied kind of um, capacity, either like very sort of low level existing digital engagement um, or looking at ways of kind of jumping those barriers by using other platforms that were already available like Instagram mm. to be able to kind of connect with people if the website wasn't kind of a space to do that or the right route to do that. Um, and uh, Jess was talking about how in her position she had, um, she'd only been working with the team for a few days before they went into lockdown. So it was a whole new project in a whole new place um, and trying to shift everything to become uh, online, but actually the sort of positivities around that experience and the ability to um, create new relationships with those groups that so they set up a young, young curators group who've been meeting regularly and have only just uh, met in person um, and developing packs and and exploring digital access and just making sure that um, the people without digital access were actually still able to participate and really trying to you know even though the jump online even if the platforms were available it was whether or not participants had that opportunity to engage with it in that way. So we were talking about that and um, yeah, and reflecting back on, you know, kind of Hannah's project around using mediums that people have straightforward access to like radio, um, yeah. so that that doesn't exclude those individuals. I don't know if anyone else from um, my group wants to chip in. I've probably forgotten something. I'm better out of breath because I'd run off and get a charger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go, challenge right there. <laughs> I think you summed it up very well. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, who else had their hand up in terms of offering to feedback? Laura, do you want to go next? Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, yes, I was in a group with uh, Anna, Amelie, and Lindsay. And um, sorry, there's a train line in my house to hear trains going by. Um, we were talking about just in terms of the inspiring points of the online space. I think our discussion touched on ideas of just the opportunities that are present in this space and how we've all had to learn about it quite quickly. So the immediacy of the space, the um, hybridity of the space. Um, we talked about how we could sort of make connections through WhatsApp groups and, and just how this all sort of happened overnight. Um, and I think a challenge that comes with that, that I thought Anna made a very good point. It's a space that we're now trying to navigate and mine and, and use productively. And so obviously quite a few projects are now revolving around good use of, of online learning and, um, and community engagement. And there's a little bit of maybe a, a delay in, in our knowledge and of best practice. So wanting to set up these projects without quite knowing how to deliver them yet. So maybe that knowledge gap is, is causing some tension right now as we're trying to, to master it so quickly. Um, a few other positives, we're just thinking about um, the, the use of online forums for our own professional development. So as practitioners ourselves, being able to have additional time and accessibility to kind of collaborative forums like this one, which maybe wasn't possible when we were all working and tied to a site um, with other commitments. I think, as was just mentioned before, but the duality of the online space um, and the fact that it does open up to so many new audiences, but you also do have digital poverty to consider. Um, so how do you navigate between those two things? And I think uh, one of the challenges that I've faced in working with students online is really trying to give agency to students and, and kind of using this platform in a way that allows for collaborative learning uh, when it can be challenging. We talked about safeguarding as well. There's just a few restrictions that we're trying to get around to, to make it an organic and uh, uh, kind of equal space for both educator and, and student. 
Um, we also talked just about how it's a space that, because we don't need to be physically rooted in it, there's all sorts of opportunities that that brings to us, but that can also bring complications, that sense of maybe being um, separated or removed from the real world um, by living online. So we just kind of uh, floated around a lot of these, these different ideas. Um, but yeah, really good discussion. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I think that picking up on your last point there, that sense of both tech bringing us together and at the same time making us feel more isolated or young people in particular feeling isolated and how we balance that as facilitators is really complex. Um, so thank you very much for that. Was there anyone else who wanted to feedback from their group? Be great to hear a little bit from you all. Yep, Hannah, great, thank you. Um, no worries, I was in a group with uh, Rona from Perth and Jenna, uh, sorry, Gemma, who's in Southport, and they both said some very interesting things. Uh, Gemma talked about how uh, the young producers that they're working with have programmed a whole festival of hope to be outdoors, uh, and then, then the pandemic happened. So you can imagine the different challenges that that posed, but you know, young people's kind of determination to continue to sort of uh, both reprogram the festival for online audiences, but also to have moments of interactivity and their patience in waiting out for a moment where that could be possible. Gemma, I hope that that is an accurate representation. Great, she sent a link um, in the chat. And uh, Rona, um, if please do interject if I'm representing this totally wrong, but uh, talked about um, uh, young people's critical voices in the wake of the toppling of the Edward Colston statue and having those honest conversations about the heritage sector uh, and, you know, what the, 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 the role of, of um, institutions and museums, especially around all the conversations about where the artifacts come from and who is telling those stories of the artifacts and whether or not it should be the people who are telling those stories, telling those stories or whether or not museums should be spaces for listening to communities about their heritage rather than representing it to others. Please, please do add to that or, or <laughs> if you'd like to. Yeah, that that's really good. It's just it's just it's so interesting to to hear. And I was just saying all of that, and then, um, but their actual visit to the museum is not due to the third of July. So it'll be interesting to see when we get them into the basement and see how their reaction changes because people always get inspired as soon as they get into these places. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to to teaching some of their attitudes and and having yeah that interaction with them. We could do a whole webinar just on that topic, I'm absolutely sure. Uh, really, really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do next is, uh, again, allow uh, 10 minutes, I think we'll be all right with 10 minutes, to go into different breakout groups so that we can uh, network with uh, colleagues we haven't met yet, if that's okay with everyone. Um, and I have put on the agenda, this is about generating ideas, uh, responding to uh, everyone's greatest wish for this session um, to be uh, inspired. Uh, it may be that you're full of ideas up to here. I certainly am at the moment. And what would be quite helpful would be just a bit of space to reflect. So don't feel free not to follow uh, what's on the agenda and to use the next 10 minutes in the way that is best helpful for you as a practitioner. Again, Tom and I will stay in the main space. Does that sound okay? Can I just have a thumbs up or a nod? Yeah, so use this next 10 minutes. Thanks, Jess. Use this next 10 minutes in the way that best suits you. If you feel after a few minutes you want to move breakout rooms, just let Tom know and he can do that and that will give you a chance to have met everyone hopefully by the end. Um, so uh, my clock uh, says uh, 20 to 4 so if we can meet back uh, at 10 to that would be wonderful and we will be back on track magically. Okay. Wonderful my screen is flashing again how good to see you all. 
thank you very much um, for taking part uh, in those breakout groups. Uh, it would be lovely just to open the floor now or the screen now to anyone who'd like to contribute a closing comments perhaps based on one thing that you might take away from today uh, or something that you'd like to follow up afterwards. Totally over to you, but it'd be lovely uh, to hear everyone's voices uh, if you're willing and able to do so, or obviously in the chat at the same time. Who's gonna be brave enough to start? Yeah, thank you, Sheena. Thank you. Um, well, for me, it's it, I found it really heartening, actually, because um, as we've been talking about our groups, the, the, the whole lockdown thing, it was such a shock. Um, and we weren't prepared the way we sort of engaged and delivered. We just weren't prepared for it. So it's been really lovely listening to other people's experiences and, and how they've sort of overcome things, but also listening to the speakers and the projects they've done. It's it really has inspired me to go back and, and, and think things, think, think about things differently. So thank you for that. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much. Anyone else just unmute yourself or add it to the chat as you prefer and are able. I was just going to say that um, it's, yeah, I've learned so much in the last year and it's been a really rich and rewarding experience in a lot of ways, but um, working online in particular, it can sometimes feel like less of a visible space to be working in and um, that it's just so helpful to see faces and to see projects and um, that, yeah, I think just having that visibility has been very, very helpful and uh, yeah, thank you very much for this, Marina. It would be great to do this again. I, I do feel very comforted by speaking to other people about their projects because I do feel like I've been in a bit of a silo for the last year in some ways. So thank you. Oh, no, thank you for contributing that. It, it has been uh, very challenging. Uh, and it's wonderful for me as well to be part of this and, and see you all. So thank you, Laura. Anyone else? I can go. I say I just like to say thank you as well. Um, I was explaining to the groups that I was with to say the Festival of Hope and the Hope Street project we'll be doing was such a big part of last year and again such a panic of getting it online and learning as we go. Um, but then we also kind of got a bit of Zoom fatigued and <laughs> overwhelmed by it all and then now having like obviously the buildings starting to reopen again and having to think. I've, I felt like I'd lost the ability to think about in, in real life activities um so i'm really you know grateful because like the idea of that working in the outside space with the creative cabin i mean we've got a lovely little garden area um in front of our building that i always forget about and i'm now in my brain going oh what can i do for the summer um which is really good <laughs> you know get get go outside the building i don't have to stay inside it's like yay it seems so simple but yeah until it's you, somebody tells you, you you don't really see it yourself because you walk past it every day um so yeah so just thank you so much for uh, for the, everybody sharing and their projects <laughs> it's been really great thank you very much for adding that Gemma really really helpful it sometimes it just does take someone else doesn't it to to see our practice from a different perspective um great to hear Okay. Anyone else in the last few minutes before I hand back over to Tom for closing comments? Uh, interesting uh, comment from Anna in the chat that I'll just bring in to audio. Um, that people were feeling re-entry anxiety. We've talked a bit about that just now, but absolutely. Um, the thought of the thought of oh, I'm working with schools at the moment um, and I'm back in delivering face to face workshops next week. Um, and I have some anxiety around that, even though I you know, live and breathe schools work. Um, 
so again great to great to be amongst colleagues and um, feel the support in the room okay um oh that's exactly what I was about to say, Geraldine. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all three of our speakers. Lots and lots of ideas, um, lots to take in, but hopefully responding to what you most wanted out of the session today. Um, I know it takes a lot of time to put these things together um, amongst everything else. So really, really appreciate it. Thanks also to Artist Rooms um, and to our evaluator, Anna. Um, if uh, anyone wants any contacts uh, following the session, feel free to get in touch with myself or Tom, and I'm sure that can be arranged. Um, conscious of Zoom fatigue and hearing my voice more than enough. Uh, yes, and a reminder of the survey, but I'm going to let you do that over audio, Tom. Thank you very much for joining us and for your time this afternoon. Great to see and hear from you all. Over to Tom for just a few closing comments. Yes, just some more thank yous, really. Um, thank you to you all for joining us and putting two hours aside of your day. I know everyone's super busy as we've been reopening and especially fitting in another Zoom call. So we do appreciate that. I hope you found it useful and we would like to continue to produce things that are useful to you and relevant to you. So I have popped the feedback survey into the chat and if you could takes a little bit of time to fill that in that would be really helpful so that we can help you in your work um thank you also to marina for bringing this session together we really appreciate it and for bringing together our three speakers hannah anna and Lindsay. um great to hear such a diversity of ideas and experiences all brought together in one session so thanks again um and if you're not already on our mailing list and you want to hear more about future opportunities, please drop us a line and we'll make sure you receive them in the future. Thank you everyone for joining us.